Joining us now is Bellator number one featherweight contender, Emmanuel El Matador Sanchez. Manny, you're on half the battle with Dan and Shaq. How's it going, man? It's going very good, my guys. Just here enjoying another day in paradise in the gym. You know, hard work, dedication, never sleeps. Man, so you truly owned the cage and showed out this past Saturday at Bellator 226. You handed the undefeated Taiwan Claxton his first ever defeat. Everything looked great, but your jujitsu really stood out as it tends to do in most of your fights. My question is about the triangle choke you had, man, because oftentimes when you think about a triangle choke, you think about hooking the leg or turning the corner to look into the guy's ear. You were facing him directly. Was this simply a case of you wanting to slice him up with elbows before you decided to fully lock in the triangle and choke him out? Yeah, slightly. I guess I was waiting for him to try to power out of it like a wrestler would, you know, try to lift me up and slam me or try to just stack me or maybe try to hit me. But uh, I just knew I didn't want him uh, out of my webs. You know what I mean? I shot my webs. My spider sense was tingling. And I shot out the spider webs, and uh, I wasn't losing the match. So first things first is uh, I wanted to make sure that that triangle stayed locked in. And wherever he tried to get out, however he tried to defend it, I wanted to be 10 steps ahead. And I didn't want to, uh, I didn't want him to get his any bit of air at all I didn't want him to breathe I didn't want him to move uh, unless I was going to take them out but once I saw that I could lock it up and have the angle I was like he's not going anywhere and yeah I knew that was done yeah congratulations on the win that was a very impressive performance now one thing I wanted to ask you is do you kind of take pride in you know beating a guy like Taiwan Claxon because Taiwan Claxon was very hyped you know I'll be honest with you in terms of the betting in the betting lines a lot of action was coming in on Taiwan Claxon in this fight and you know me and my good friend Dan here were telling people to go otherwise but uh, do you take pride in finishing one of their hype prospects a guy that you know quite frankly kind of hasn't had the, a similar road like you you know you were fighting guys like Pat Curran and Henry Corrales very early in your Bellator career as where in this fight it kind of seemed like he was uh, downplaying your uh, accomplishments so far yeah actually it did and uh i took uh offense to uh, a lot of the things that i was uh, hearing but i never took it personal i'm like i get it he's uh, hyped himself up even more or get whatever confidence he thinks he uh he needs or can have but to me i think in in his mind what i saw through his mind was that that uh, I'd never faced anyone with his kind of style, with his kind of whatever he brings to the table. And to me, it's, that's like same shit, different story. You know what I mean? I have dealt with that against every opponent that I faced. Everybody never gives me the light of day. They always think someone's going to run right through me just based on, uh, I don't know, one fight or two, who knows, you know, or physical appearance even. They just feel like they have an edge over me, which is cool. It's something that uh, I've had since I was a kid and always been overlooked and always been the underdog and all that stuff, but that's cool. You know, to me, I, I, I really I don't care at all what people think and opinions and uh, betting odds and all that. I, to me, I'm always going in as the underdog. Uh, I'm always going in as the guy who's got to prove something to people, you know, got to prove to the world, I guess, how good I really am, how dominant I can really be and how hungry I am, too to make a statement, to, to go out and prove that I'm the best. And that just comes from my skills in everyday training. That doesn't come from my hype or BS that people go smoke up my ass on Instagram and Facebook and all that, this and that. This comes from nothing but blood, sweat, and tears, the real hard work and dedication every single day in the gym. Now, Manny, obviously with Tyron Claxton, not only was he an undefeated prospect, but his flying knee knockout – was shown on SportsCenter Top 10. And when you hear a 5-0 and guy say Emmanuel Sanchez is average everywhere and completely disregard your abilities to that extent, is it one of those things where it's just another fight or did you feel a little extra incentive to make an extra point, not just to win, Manny, but to finish the kid inside two rounds and teach him a lesson? Uh, yeah, yeah, both. You know, not only uh, win, but win decisively. But I'm, I'm very proud of myself, honestly, because... Not only, okay, yeah, so many people, you know, bringing so much on the line with this Grand Prix, with a million dollars and two belts and, you know, oh, do you want the title right away? I get all these, you know, stupid questions right away, man. Like, this, how much does the title mean to you? How, how much does being a millionaire feel to you? And I'm just like, man, in my mind, even when you're out the other, I, I take it like this. 
there's four men that I need to win, you know, this tournament that I got. So one is down and one was already one of the hardest because this kid, like you said, was undefeated and had all this hype behind him, sports center up his ass, all these people kissing his ass, thinking that he's God's gift to MMA. And I'm sure he thought that this was going to be a walk in the park for him. And to be honest with you, I was getting ready for a real beast. I really was. But, uh, you know, I, I handled that beast uh, with flying colors, you know, because uh, for being such a powerhouse wrestler, he, his wrestling didn't feel that great to me. For being so uh, so hyped, for being explosive and dynamic, uh, he wasn't as explosive and dynamic as I thought he would be <laughs> compared to my training partners. And uh, I was so in the zone, man, one of the easiest fight weeks I've ever had easiest ways to make weight, easiest, uh, uh, everything, man. I didn't have my coaches with me. You know, I had my two other coaches in the UFC and Abu Dhabi with my other teammates, Paul Felder and, uh, Allah Muhammad. So I had one coach and two of my teammates and, uh, even just, you know, not having my coaches right by my side all week and me cutting weight alone and doing everything in my own team. This is, this is all in my own hands, you know? So I had to be my own you know, and that's something my coach Duke Rufus instills in us too, because they're not our babysitters. You know, these are our coaches teach us how to be our own quarterbacks out there. So we never know if we need to audible, if we need to pass, we need to shoot, we need to run, we need to, you know, et cetera. We need to know what to do when we're out there out in the cage, right, on our own. So I, I, I felt I, I felt nothing but fear coming from this man. You know, every time that uh, I looked in his eyes and swung at him and moved at him, I never seen someone so afraid in my life. So. I'm proud of myself that, yeah, I did exactly what I said I was going to do, finish him in the first or second round and prove to the world what the difference between an athlete and a fighter is. And I think they got to see what a real fighter looks like. Now, coming into this tournament, you got the five-round experience against, you know, the champ champ in Bellator, Patricio Pitbull. I mean, not a lot of people uh, talk about that fight, but in my opinion, you know, it was, a, it was a arguably a fight of the year contender. I mean, there is a, a few clips of there of Patricio, uh, you know, running away from you in that fight, man. It was 2-2 two to two going into the fifth round. Not a lot of people can say that. You know, Michael Chandler, the 55 champion, he got finished inside uh, less than one uh what one minute? One yeah. Minute. So, uh, yep. do you think that do you think that that five round experience has helped you in your confidence in your game? You know, even more going into this tournament, as where you know a lot of these guys like Carvalho and Borix, you know, they really haven't had. You know, Borix fought a uh, kind of a washed up version of Pat Corn. You know, they haven't really fought this. Uh, this high world-class level of competition that you have and not even, you know, go two to two with the guy, you know what I'm saying? Going into the fifth round. Uh, do you think that's going to help you? Absolutely. You know, and not only facing the current champion, you know, and being such a dominant champion that he is, but, you know, now I just faced uh, a top contender, you know, who had uh, all this, who says he wanted all the smoke, but that didn't look like someone who wanted smoke to me. I don't know what you guys think uh, <laughs> what smoke looks like. But, uh, yeah, I'll start saying that in my interviews from now on. Claim they want the smoke. Well, uh, what's up? The fires are here, man. They don't want to get burned. So, yeah, I don't think they want any smoke. But, nah, man, you know, I'm, I'm speaking humbly about all this. You know, truly, let, let's just be real. You know, and this goes for Claxton and all the other guys as well, too. How many of these guys have they sent to the hospital? You know? Did they send any, you know, a former champ to the hospital? Like, did they <laughs> knock any <laughs> teeth out? Did they, did they, you know, really uh, solidify a dominant win? You know, I mean, Borix, yes, just now. But uh, a dominant win streak, you know what I mean, against guys in this Grand Prix. I won't even say former champions because we don't even need to say former champions. But let's just say if you want to talk about top fighters, top contenders, how many, how many other guys other than Henry Corrales, really, and two guys that are out of the tournament now, Curran and Strauss, but how many other guys have faced, you know, multiple guys in this Grand Prix? Nobody. Just me. So, uh, you know, but I take that with, you know, uh, as a piece of humble pie, though, because uh, three of them didn't go my way. You know, Pitbull, uh, a robbery against Vito, and Curran, who's not out. But we got two guys still in. As of September 28th, we're going to see if they still stay in. But to me, man, you know, I, I have the, nothing but confidence right now because I'm still in the gym just worked out today. I've been teaching and, you know, training all week here. You know, this is, this is really my livelihood. This is the, this is really my lifestyle. You know, I, I'm not a, I'm not going to say I, I have nothing else to do or I can't do anything else, but this is real, like my real passion, my real drive, my real, my real why, you know, and I, I really, I'm a true student of the game and really do 
love mixed martial arts, the, everything about it, you know, the spring, the striking, the, uh, every little thing, man. And then the fight, man, the fight is even sweeter, something even sweeter, man. You just get to go out there and enjoy the moment. That's where all the hard work, you know, pays off to, to, walk, to be able to walk down that ramp and show the world why I'm the best, you know. So uh, for me, it's just really the, the overtime, you know. That's, that's really it. That's why I have that hashtag, and it, it's dedication. You know, so my edge is not only in who I have faced. My edge is just, uh, you know, constantly being in the gym and constantly wanting to do better, you know, because I feel like I could have finished Plaxton in the first round. I should have got that takedown sooner and stopped him with strikes in the first round. But, you know, hey, I got the submission in the second. In my mind, I'm like, damn, what took me so long? But, you know, it's all a part of learning. I took it as, you know what, hey, I didn't. I walked out of there, not a scratch on me. He didn't hurt me anywhere. Did I want to knock him out? Yeah. Did I want to give him the first? Yeah. But, hey, regardless, we got the finish. We got our hand raised. First round is done. And now, all right, let's, you know, let's focus on and see who's next. And it could be any of the, the three that I was just on the same card as or the next four going in, in this tournament. We're going to get down to the final eight, man. I'm excited to see who's next, you know, because then quarterfinals and semifinals and boom, you know, and I'm looking to, to clean house, man, to clean up this whole thing. Four men, three left to go. One's out, three more to go. Let's do this. Man, it's exciting times. And, you know, if I was coaching someone to fight Emmanuel Sanchez, the mindset would be this is going to be a life and death war until the very end. And, you know, as we know, we've already mentioned it on the show, Claxton was kind of acting like the fight was over before it even began. And it really seems like you know, past experiences have helped you stay calm and poised for situations like that. And it's funny because I was talking to you before the fight and you said the following words, man. And you said, we are going to see how much he really loves to fight. This ain't wrestling. I love this side of Manny Sanchez with a chip on his shoulder. So do you feel like you accomplished your goal of finding out how much this kid really likes to fight? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I, I think we saw, right. And I think I couldn't have said it better. And I hate going in with the thing with the time, but yeah, it didn't seem like uh, he wanted all that smoke to me. That, I don't know what that wanting smoke looks like, but that didn't. That's not the vibe I got, you know. And uh, I knew I had it, man, since uh, since we first uh, locked eyes. Actually, we didn't get to see each other at all fight week, but uh, on accident, Bellator had put the scale in the blue workout room. So I walk in the workout room and had to check my weight, and it's not like I was in there to eavesdrop. I didn't give a damn what anybody's training looks like. You can watch my training, and I'll tell you how I'm going to beat you, and I'll still do it. So watch my training all you want. I don't care. But I walk in on him training, and I saw the first look he gave me, and he looked miserable. I'm like, ah, his weight looks, looks like he's dying right now. Like, oh, he's so scared to see me right now. He wants to work even harder right now. I see it. I check my weight. I'm on weight, and I see him all layered up, tired dying over there and I'm like oh, we're going to have some fun on Saturday and after I was on weight I went to go play video games with my friends and then uh, you know uh, fight day comes along actually weigh in day where we actually get to lock eyes and do the live show weigh in and the second we locked eyes and Tony Montana you know the eyes don't lie man I saw him break and yeah that that comes with something with experience because I remember what that was like actually when I was uh, when I was a young little undefeated guy you know, or when I thought I was on top of the world or I thought I was invincible. And yeah, you know, it's, uh, it's very humbling when you handle, hand someone their first loss. I know what that feels like. I know what that feels like to be undefeated. I remember what that felt like to lose for the first time. And yeah, we're going to see how much that makes or breaks him, you know, for his next fights. But I was very glad I was being able, be able to be the one to do it for him. You know, because no one goes undefeated forever. Now, I want to get into your training a little bit, man, because when uh, cause when we watch you fight, when the fans watch you fight, it just seems like you're one of these fighters that just do not allow guys to rest. And, and I mean in any position. You know, generally in most fights, you know, guys can rest in the clinch here and there. But it just seems like when they fight you, that uh, you're just always peppering them. You're always making them work. I mean, even, you know, if they get takedowns, you know, they got to watch out for the triangles. Uh, I mean, is it, you know, from uh, some type of long distance running or is it just uh, work in the gym? I mean, because, uh, I mean, look, Patricio Pipple in that fourth round, he couldn't handle it. I mean, guys, you know, kind of get overwhelmed by the pace and the volume, man. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And uh, that's, that kind of kind of comes from one of my monikers and my little fight mottos. Uh, from bell to bell, just give them hell. You know what I mean? Honestly, from the second the fight starts to the second the fight ends. Uh, and I guess that kind of 
can come from like some sport related stuff. You know, you just make them never forget the the night that they played you, but we ain't playing, you know, this is fighting. So, all right. Uh, it's a Carlton Gracie quote too. It says even even if you're not victorious, you know what I mean. Make the make the enemy pay a steep price for victory. So, Patricio Pitbull got his hand raised over me, but he was pissing blood after the fight, and uh, he barely walked. So, you know, and I, I I was fine. So I just had a little scratch below my eye. So uh, yeah, you know I, I take pride in stuff like that. You know, uh, I mean, it, it it's a fight, and people got to remember that. You know. Uh, I, yeah, I'm a nice guy. I like to consider myself a strong man of God. But, uh, yeah, when that cage door closes, we, we all know what, what goes down when it closes. And I, I realize what another man is trying to do to me. And I'm not the type to 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 take too kindly to that. And I make sure it's him, not me. And if it's going to be me, then it's going to be him twice as bad. <laughs> You know, Manny, on this topic, after a title fight that doesn't go your way, I've noticed a lot of fighters never come back the same because it's a life goal. And if it doesn't work out the first time, they break. In your case, I've noticed that you reinvented yourself and came back a brand new man. How do you keep evolving, staying fresh, and consistently showing off new facets of your game every single time out? Uh, you know, I, being a, a realist, man, you know... Uh... I don't think a lot of fighters will ever admit this, you know, on the mic or, you know, in public, nothing, but, um, you know, I, I'm not stupid. You know, I realize that I could be knocked out. I could be submitted. I'm not invincible. You know, we're, we're all fighters are human. We get that sense, you know, that aura that we're, we're godlike and that nothing bad could ever happen to us in there, especially when you start to have a lot of success when you're undefeated or when, you know, Maybe if you're not undefeated, but if you haven't really tasted, you know, what it, what it feels like to, to get hurt in a fight, I'll call it like, I'll call it what it is, you know what I mean? To take some serious punishment in a fight. So I have had that, <laughs> victorious or not. And I, I realize how, how much, you know, I want to fight intelligently to have a long, healthy career, you know, not only, you know, in the cage while I still want to fight, but also after, you know, so when my time is done. And I realized, you know, we ain't playing chess and I'm not going to be looking like a supermodel like Mario Lopez or some shit. But, <laughs> you know, because I already got, a, you know, I got some scars to my to my name. But I put on some exciting fights for it at least. And, you know, I got, like I said, I got my hand raised for it or earn respect from MMA fans and people all over the world, you know, for a fight like that. And, you know, from a world-class fighter, a two-weight world champ right now, you know what I mean? So uh, I, I just, I take pride in, okay, the, the opposition that I faced, the the wrongs that have gone my way, the rights that have gone my way, uh, me being a realist, you know, knowing that that can happen to me in there. So I, I always fight my ass off and do my best to, to do that to them. And so it doesn't happen to me. That's, that's the way we say. I'm never going to say I can't, you know, it would be wrong to say that's never going to happen to me. But I fight my ass off to make sure that can be avoided. I think, guys, uh, defense is something that's underrated. You know, something that's very, very underrated in the sport of striking, in the sport of mixed martial arts. But, you know, look at Floyd Mayweather in boxing. You know, stuff like that, not only being undefeated, but to never been knocked down, to never been knocked out. You know, that's a, that's a, that's a great feat in itself, too. And people bring it up a lot already with me, too, you know, for as many fights as I have, but also never being stopped in my career. You know, so I'm not saying I want to go out and fight to never be stopped or never, you know, ever lose again. But uh, I, I just always focus on, I'm not going to say my weaknesses, but what I need to work harder at. And where I'm, what I'm, where I'm good at, I want to just continue to grow on that and capitalize on that. Just keep getting better at that. So in any position, like you've mentioned, nowhere, you're safe nowhere in the fight with me. That's how I want to be. Everywhere and every day in training, I always got to get better at, oh, this is where I can elbow someone, hit someone. Oh, this is where I can look for a submission. Oh, this is where I can, you know take him down, get the ground and pound or get a stoppage from right here or get a finish from right here, et cetera. So that's the way my mind works, you know, and that's why they call me a chameleon. Everywhere I go, uh, standing around the ground, I'm looking to finish. I'm looking to dominate. I'm looking to win. And that's all the, not only ring time that I have with some of the best in the world, but the training that I have here at Rufus Fort Mixed Martial Arts Academy with the best in the world as well, every single day. And now let's say, let's say you make it to the finals on one end and 
Patricio Pitbull makes it, you know, through all his uh, competition that he's got to, and you guys rematch. Now, we know the first fight was honestly just a, a simple mistake going into the fifth round, but we know how one-sided the fourth round uh, was. Now, what would you do differently uh, going into the rematch with Pitbull? <sighs> well, I knock him out, obviously. That's what I would do differently. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, you know, like I said, in, uh, you know, like Kirk okay, is almost said about Claxton here. Uh, you know, of course, give him the utmost amount of respect, but I can't respect him so much that, you know, it held me back from holding my game. And, yeah, I mean, other than Daniel Weitzel, who else has nearly knocked him out in the first round? You know, and I kind of had him a couple times there at that end. So um, what I would do differently is yeah, to really go and knock him out, that's for sure, now that I trust and believe in my power and everything that I know that I can bring to the table. I, I, I realize and understand that uh, I'm getting better, you know, and I got to trust in the work that I put in. And that's something that my coach, Duke Rufus, again, you know, tells me and how I've matured and grown as well, too. Not just from the title fight, but uh, the, these years in training, you know, uh, each and every single time I go out there, man, it's just, it gets easier. It feels like it's the first time, it's the best time. But this being a high profile fight going into my last fight, you know, I'm, like I said, I was really proud of myself, you know, championship weight, easy again, like a G made it like twice. I still ate up all the way up until weigh-ins. Like I told you, I was out playing video games beforehand this fight week. I did the most media I've ever done ever for a fight week. I was even surprised. I'm like, wow, they want me to film a lot. Wow. They're making me do a lot of stuff. Wow. This is cool. Like, but to me, I just took it all as a blessing and realized, you know, knew the only reason I went to San Jose was to whoop somebody's ass. I mean, I get my hand released, and I did just that. So, you know, uh, everything pre-fight, during the fight, uh, everything. Like, I'm honestly, I it, it takes a lot for me to say this, but I've never really like been proud of myself. So now that I know how to trust the work that I put in, and the, how I feel in there, what I want to do in there, implement my game, everything. That's something that my coach Duke Griffiths has you know told us, and to trust ourselves. That's why we train so hard. You know, what are we saving ourselves for? Go out there and, you know, if you thought I left it on the line before, wait till you see my face now. Now I know exactly what I want to do and how I want to do it, man. And, and I'm loving every second of it. I'm making the rest of my life the best of my life. That's right. That's right. Just keep telling them. So, Manny, it's no longer the up-and-comer Emmanuel Sanchez. Now it's the perennial number one contender and one of the most exciting fighters in the history of the company. Do you feel like Bellator are really starting to get behind you? Yeah, yeah, I do now. Uh, I signed a new deal with, uh, with Bellator uh, upon this Grand Prix. So the numbers that they gave me and everything that they gave me, they said, uh, you know, now would be like uh, a time where the UFC would not match or get anything better. And Bellator seems to really, you know, be interested in your kid. And obviously they have since they've re-signed you multiple times now. And I'm like, you know what, I'm entirely happy with this. Um, I'm very fortunate to, to be a, a considered a top, uh, well, how should I say, I guess commodity, right, for the company, but a top fighter, you know what I mean? Uh, uh, a top asset, uh, someone that they're very pleased to be in business with, uh, to have on the roster, to have in the division. And, yeah, it, it feels very good to, to be considered one of the best in the world uh, for us. If not the top best MMA organization out there, and also out in the zone now too. So, you know, yeah, I'm very, very fortunate, blessed, and grateful for this opportunity. You've been an exciting fighter your entire career, but now it seems like you're about to enter the realm of greatness. Does it motivate you that much more knowing you're on the cusp of a, of accomplishing some incredible heights? Absolutely. You know, I thought 26 was great. Like uh, 25 going into 26, you know, that was. Upon after taking the current fight and then getting established in what Bellator was, you know, because Bellator has even grown in tears over these years. You know, I've been with the company going now in uh, five years, and I've seen every time I've, I've fought, I've seen some some drastic change. You know, uh, so what Viacom and Zone and everything what they're doing is uh, honestly genius work, and I, I'm falling in love with it, man. I, I really am. I'm very glad to be uh, along for the ride. Uh, as I was saying earlier, being uh, considered a top featherweight and uh, top fighter for Bellator, it's just amazing, you know, especially with how big Bellator is now and all everything that they're doing. And I uh, just soaking it all in, like I said, man, just soaking it all in. Uh, because now that uh, they have all these new, new signees now, 
you know, they could be UFC vets, 1FC vets, uh, just uh, building up new talent they have, like with some teammates that I have. Uh, it's just ever-growing, man. It's something amazing to be a part of. So I spoke to you about this in depth yesterday, but we'll briefly touch on it here on Half the Battle. So it used to be a thing where you say you're a pro fighter and people would ask, but are you a UFC fighter? And back in the day, that used to really hurt the feelings of a lot of fighters. But now it really seems like guys are being compensated properly and can make a real living outside the UFC. Do you feel a certain way about not being a UFC fighter? Or is it at the point now where you're literally living out your dreams of making a serious living and getting great exposure being a professional MMA fighter? Oh, man, I'm really living out my dreams, that's for sure, and being a successful MMA fighter. Yeah, because, no, yeah, you're right. You know, that, I mean, before, that, that question used to be come up a lot, you know, upon re-signing as many times as I have with Bellator. That question used to come up all the time on um, would I sign or has the UFC ever come calling, et cetera. And to me, yeah, now it, it'd be stupid. You know, I mean, don't get me wrong. It, is it great? Yeah, are they a great promotion? Yeah, of course. But, uh, I'm really enjoying what I'm doing right now, and I, I'm, I'm just so blessed that, yeah, it would be, you know, silly to go anywhere else, honestly, anywhere else, not just the UFC, but anywhere else. So, uh, hardcore MMA fans, they know, you know, obviously the casuals, which is hard to almost nowadays be a casual, because you got to get all these apps, and MMA is just so big everywhere, man, global, you know, MMA is so huge everywhere i think it's almost just hard to be a, a casual in ufc now because ufc now they got the ufc every week who's going to be on this card it's going to be a pay-per-view or a fight night you know i got so many uh my teammates as well too and so many different ufc cards that i sometimes forget that my teammates have fights and i'm like damn that's not good man <laughs> you know so it uh at least with bellator you know you always know what you're going to get man one or two big shows a month or multiple shows throughout the weekend but Thing is, you can see they're doing international now, so they got the European market. Eventually, I'm sure they'll grow more in the Americas, uh, or they're in uh, Canada, or you know, Brazil, Mexico, etc., somewhere down there. But uh, yeah, man, uh, obviously the Bellator is growing along with just like any other MMA promotion, and uh, uh, you know, I got to fight in Israel, so I'm sure it'll open up for other other arenas and other venues throughout the world after this Grand Prix. Now, I'm just curious to know, man, you've been in a lot of tough fights in Bellator, a lot of fights where it seems like they were kind of matching you up, kind of to get set up in a sense. Now, which one of those wins was the win that let you know that you can fight on this world-class level? And uh, which one of those wins let you know that you were uh, going to possibly fight for a title multiple times? Uh, I, I guess I'd have to say my loss to Kern, to be honest with you, because Kern was just training with us two weeks before that fight. Uh, it, it was all crazy by crazy, unfortunate circumstance. He, you know, his cousin trains not far from here too in the Midwest area, about an hour or something away from Milwaukee. And they just wanted more sparring for their sparring days. So, uh, they asked if they could come up here. So they did. And at the time I had just won my second Bellator fight. So we allowed it because, you know, I had title and I was, you know, I just got signed. So we figured we're, far away enough from each other that it'd be all right to get some training in and maybe later on we fight. But right now we're obviously on two different sides of the spectrum in the division. Well, sure enough, they give me the call to fight Pat Curran on short notice. And uh, to me, it's not, you know, obviously that wasn't something Bellator just decided to do out of nowhere. To me, I took it as a compliment. I'm like, oh, wow. Like they think that, uh, you know, I can hang with the uh, former champs and one of the best in the world. And, you know, they offered us that opportunity. So, it would have been dumb not to take it. And ever since then, uh, I've gotten all these uh, high-profile fights since then. I felt one right after that other, you know, on short notice. And that's what helped build me in Bellator because I don't think I was supposed to do well against Pat. I don't think they expected that. I don't think they expected me to be Henry, Justin, Daniel, or to do well against Daniel Vico or any of these other guys that I was, uh, you know, uh, supposed to fight or beat, you know. And, uh, yeah, I think they changed their minds drastically. Uh, once they saw me beat Georgie for the first time, that was a breakout year because in that year I beat Georgie, Marcos, and Daniel. Stubbs. So all the holders in 2017, all victories. So that was a great 2017. So, man, you've had 23 professional fights. You've beaten former champions, number one contenders, top prospects, UFC vets, the whole bit. 
What fight are you most proud of? And what I mean by that is, if you ever have kids one day, what would be the first Matador Sanchez fight you show them? Ooh, what would be the first one that I'd show them? Huh. It's a good question. I don't know. I think I'd have to say this. probably the first title fight, because then I could explain to them everything that happened to me prior to the fight, during the fight, and after the fight. You know, because uh, it didn't go my way, but Honestly, that was another one, one of the best fights that I've ever had. You know, a lot of, like I said, I think that's what made Bellator, Scott Coker, and uh, MMA fans around the world probably never want me to be on tape delay ever again. And they probably never want to have me fight overseas again either, especially if it's not live, you know. So I think uh, the the MMA fans, the, the fighters, and Bellator most definitely, you know, Loved seeing that fight. I I even, you know, I'm watching that fight. I'm like, damn, wow, yeah, I surprised myself. He just, for fighting across the world and being able to fight like that, I'm like, wow. You know, hey, yeah, I didn't, I, I can take the positive from this, you know what I mean? So, it, uh, I probably show him that one. It's an interesting format that Bellator's got for this uh, Grand Prix. Now, is a part of you, you know, kind of scouting out uh, these guys that fought the same night as you, like uh, Borix, Campos, uh, Carvalho, or is a part of you just so comfortable in your experience and all the lessons you've learned that you're you're not even worried about it? Yeah, I'm not even worried about it. Um, I wasn't even in the same locker room with those guys. I was in the same locker room as the guys who lost. So uh, I was the only one in my locker room who won that night. <laughs> But, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm not too focused on it or care all that much. Um, I know those are all three of those guys are great fighters. And you never know. I could be on the same side of the bracket as them, or uh, we can be mixed with guys in L.A., or we'll see. You know, I have no idea. Uh, personally, a lot of people have already asked me, yeah, about the title, or who do I want next, or what. They, I don't know, whatever questions they think. They, I don't know what they're trying to get out of me. But uh, I don't care. I would choose, if I did get the title fight, great. You know, I mean, all these five, these fights are going to be five rounds anyway. But I'm hunting the title at the end. So I'm not really too focused on wanting the title right away because I know what the grand prize is. And the grand prize is the undisputed featherweight world champion. That's the guy right there, you know, because there's still three more in my mind right now. So... Uh, I wouldn't care if it's Carvalho next, Campos next, or Boric next, or any of the guys or the winners in, in L.A. So, I mean, I'll just, uh, like I've been saying in any other interview for any whoever, it's whoever, whenever, whatever, man, I don't care. I'd love to fight in December, though. So if I could choose when, I'd probably choose when, and I'd like to fight in December. I, I'd want to fight ASAP, actually, but... We'll have to wait till the next cards come up, and I feel like December is going to be the quickest one. So this isn't a question for right now. This is for kind of down the line. But, I mean, you are approaching your 25th pro fight pretty pretty soon here. So you already have a reputation of putting it all on the line every time you fight. You're also an incredibly kind person outside the cage. So what kind of legacy do you want to leave behind in this sport when you finally put the gloves down? Uh, honestly, just just a true fighter, man. Uh, obviously, humble martial artist for sure. Uh, as you mentioned, just always be as kind as can be. You gotta spread kindness, right? So I don't want to be cheesy and have like talk about those memes and stuff like that. But you know, yeah, spread kindness, especially as martial artists. We already get a bad rep sometimes, as it is from some other fighters doing bad things in the in the media and making headlines for bad reasons. You know, being really notorious. You know, something getting famous for doing something bad, so infamous. And I think we need to obviously, yeah, spread more peace, love, positivity, and kindness uh, in the world so we don't give martial arts a bad rep, so people don't think poorly of us as they do already or if they don't already, et cetera. But uh, some, as far as the fight goes, someone, like I said, a true fighter, someone who just left it all on the line, his heart, his blood, his bones, his sweat, his spirit, his balls, everything, like, just left it all on the line, you know, and did whatever he could possibly do to get his hand raised, you know, I, I, wanna, I want people to see that passion, that desire, you know, and 
that that's just how much I truly love to fight, you know, and truly love to to win. You know, I really I love success, I love victory. I'm I'm, I'm addicted to that. I'm addicted to the feeling of being able to go out there. You know, I, I that's why I work so hard, as, as hard as I do, because the no sacrifice, no victory, man. So when I get my hand raised and my name gets announced, it's the best feeling in the world. That's right there. You know, it's, uh, the true success of everything that you you suffered, you endured in training. You know, uh, all those long nights, sleepless nights, early mornings, etc. Getting bitched at the gym, getting your ass whooped in the gym. Like it was worth it, man. Yeah, you know, I the Bellator Hall of Fame. It's something that I'd love to to have when you know when I hang up the gloves for sure. You know, you, you never forget uh, the St. Pierre's, the Pens, the Liddells, the Gracies. So. Uh, most definitely being world champion, man, and being a legend and being a Hall of Famer is something that I want to I wanna leave behind. I have to ask you about this, man, because I don't think anyone's asked you about it, but it's something that I definitely noticed. So obviously, you had that amazing fight with Pitbull. Could have gone either way. Five-round war, fight of the year, the whole bit. Now, after that fight, he went on to fight former lightweight champion Mike Chandler, who actually, he was the champion at the time when they fought, right? Yeah. So Mike Chandler, yeah. made, so, Mike Chandler made some remarks, man. Uh, he, he said some stuff about, you know, uh, Pitbull just fought a flyaway. Basically, he was calling Manny Sanchez a flyaway, and then Mike Chandler went on to get sparked unconscious in under one minute. I kind of just want your opinion on uh, Mike Chandler's uh-huh. comments, and I know right now you're focused on the tournament, but down the line, do you think you guys will ever run it? Uh, I do, actually, because uh, funny you mentioned that. You know, man, I'm, I'm focused on this man free and nothing else. You know, so like I said, there's three men. They're random right now. We'll find out at in this game, too, that I, mean, I got to think about to take out first. But, yeah, that was a plan of mine for sure, to be able to go up to lightweight and ask Michael Chandler about that, and maybe we should settle it in the cage, too, because, uh, yeah, I did uh, hear and see that uh, – he called me a flyweight, and I just want to know uh, what's up with that. And, well, you know, now I don't really take that that much of an insult because, hey, man, uh, he called me a flyweight, but I didn't get starched in a minute. So, I mean, <laughs> see who a real flyweight is. You know what I mean? And to me, I mean, Pitbull was saying he'd knock out Canelo, and he just said he'd knock out Khabib today. And I just told BJPenn.com that he doesn't hit that hard. So, huh, I mean... For Michael Taylor to get starts with him in a minute, and I'm a flyweight, and I don't think he hits that hard. So I don't know. Yeah, we'll. Uh, I guess we'll we'll see what happens down the line in the future. But but as of right now, I most definitely, along with not only being a legend and a world champion and winning this Grand Prix, uh, yeah, being one of the most dominant you know champions ever. So featherweight, undisputed featherweight world champion. And honestly, my man, that could come from beating Pitbull in this Grand Prix. Or that could be, like, my victory over them. So, look, uh, Curran has a win over me, but now Curran is out of this Grand Prix. So I can do something bigger by going and winning this Grand Prix. Daniel Weichel has a win over me, which he knows he didn't, but he got his hand raised over me that night. What can say something bigger than me is if I don't get him again in this tournament, it's winning this thing. So... You know, that that's going to be my uh, – because at the end of the day, there's no denying that. Hey, man, yeah, okay, you got to win over me, but who won this Grand Prix? So who's the best in the world now? So right now, my main focus, for sure, is being the guy who won the Featherweight World Grand Prix. And if we have to, we'll make a lightweight one after this, you know, if I go up, and we'll see. But as for right now, most definitely be the, the best damn Featherweight in the world right now and in Bellator MMA. Manny, uh, thanks so much for being so gracious with your time, man. We really appreciate it. You know, thanks for taking the time to speak with us right here, right now on Half the Battle. The fans can follow you on Twitter at El Matador145, on Instagram at Matador Sanchez. Uh, Manny, any message for the fans? Just want to say thank you guys very much for having me. Peace and love to everybody for uh, for staying tuned and uh, listening to us talk about this great featherweight Grand Prix and everything we got in the night today. And uh, stay tuned for the next one. Going to be some big news coming soon. And uh, peace and love. God bless. Thank you, guys. Yes, sir. You have a great day, Manny, and thanks again for the time. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it, bro.